to be here with y'all this morning. How about y'all? How are you doing? Good. Did you guys have a good Christmas? We got a pretty good crowd in here today. I see y'all way, way back there, I guess. All right. I to, I'm glad there's a couple people up here because if it was just going to be back there, I was going to say, okay, everyone's got to come up here because we're not singing by ourselves up here. All right. Hey, my name is David and this is Keith. It's so good to be here with you today. Um, you know, I'm still kind of in the Christmas spirit a little bit. I know it's after Christmas, but are y'all a little bit still in the Christmas spirit? Okay. All right. Good. Because we're going we're gonna to start out with a little Christmas song here. Why don't you stand up with us? All right. This song, but this is a little bit different way of doing it. Silent night, holy night, all is calm, oh, all is bright, round young virgin, mother and child. I tell you what, before we kind of get started with our worship set here, I want you to turn around to somebody and give them like a long distance high five or elbow bump or a handshake or a hug or whatever you want to do, okay? I'm just so thankful this morning to be here, thankful to be able to uh, 
you know, have this time together and worship the Lord. Now, what's that mean? It's just where we just come together and we thank God for all that he's done and all that he is. And we just ascribe majesty and worth to his name. And you know, one of the things when I think about Christmas and I think about Jesus and what he has done in my life, I'm glad that I am no longer burdened by the shame and guilt of the sin, the sin that, hey, we all share and we've all are guilty of. But through Jesus and because he came and because of what he did, he lifted all the shame and all the guilt off of us. And we don't have to be afraid anymore of anything, not even death. Amen? And I'm so thankful for that. Cause I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, cause I am a child of God. And I'm no longer a slave to fear. Oh, cause I am a child of God. Unravel me with a melody. You surround me with a song of deliverance from my enemies. Oh, till all my fear is gone. And I'm no longer.
child of God. So I'll 
Won't you pray with me this morning? Thank you so much for singing. Lord, we're just so thankful that we can be here with you today. Thank you that you meet with us here. That you have something for each and every one of us. It's not a mistake that any soul is represented here today, Lord. You brought us here for a reason. And we just wait expectantly on you and what you want to do in our heart and in our life, Lord. And the lives of those around us. We give you praise and thanks. We open our hearts to your word and your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and be seated. Thank you. Good morning, church. Hope everybody had a Merry Christmas. We did at our house. It was quiet. It was, I thought, going to be restful, but somehow at the end of the day, I was exhausted. <laughs> I don't know about you, but it, was, uh, but it was fun. So for those of you who don't know me, my name is Corey Sargent, and I'm on staff here at Crossroads. And today I'm going to start by asking you a few questions. What are you tethered to? What are you tethered to? See, when, when we're born, we're, we're tethered to our parents, right? They feed us, they bathe us, they change our diapers, they, they protect us. And, and really, we're tethered to them more out of necessity than anything because we can't do it ourselves when we're born. And as we grow, we get tethered to school or sports or hobbies. And then if we grow even further, it seems like we get tethered to our jobs, our marriages, our families, or maybe just general responsibilities. What are, you, what are you tethered to today? And the bigger question I have for you is, is there evidence that you're tethered to Jesus? Is there evidence that you're tethered to Jesus? Today we're going to be looking in the book of Matthew, uh, chapter 11, and verses 28 through 30. If you have your Bibles, turn, if you would, to that, uh, Matthew 11 and verses 28 to 30. If not, the words will be on the screen for you as we go through. And let's read that now. Come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. And every time I read that scripture without really taking a dive into it, my life doesn't really coincide with that. My burden is light, right? Because my burdens can be heavy. In this passage, every time I read it, I always think, what is God talking about here? What's Jesus saying here? Because it doesn't seem to make sense to me because my life doesn't reflect that. So, as we always hear when it comes to Scripture, let's look at context and background. So, if you go back to your uh, Matthew chapter 10, um, and just a brief synopsis of what happened before Jesus said this. In Matthew chapter 10, what Jesus does is he sits down his disciples, and he says, Hey, I'm going to send you out. I don't want you to take any clothing. I don't want you to pack a suitcase. I don't want you to think about where you're going to stay. I don't want you to make reservations. I don't want you to think about your lodging accom accommodations. Um, I don't want you to think about food or water. I don't want you to think about any of your physical needs. I got that covered for you. But let me tell you what's going to happen. And he tells his disciples that what's going to happen to them is they're going to be persecuted. They're going to be hated. They're going to be flogged. They're going to be put in prison. And Jesus tells them they're, this is going to happen to them because they're doing what Jesus has called them to do. That Jesus is sending them to do something that's going to cause all this to happen. And then Jesus follows that up by saying, by the way, when they hate you, know that they hated me first. And they're only really hating you because you're a part of me. So Jesus is basically telling his disciples, hey, I got you covered physically. You're not going to have any needs. However, there's going to be a cost. There's going to be a cost. There's a responsibility in that. And what we see in chapter 10 is not necessarily just the mission of what to expect from 
or for the disciples of those days. It's actually the mission for every person who calls himself a follower of Jesus. We are going to be persecuted. It's not a maybe. It's not hopefully not. We will be persecuted. We will be hated. And we're going to one day probably be treated as criminals. If most people who are Christians today understood that when they accepted the mission, I don't know that they would be willing to sign on the dotted line for that. So that's what happened in chapter 10. And go back to chapter 11 in the main text today. Jesus says, come to me, all of you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. In the next verse there, he uses the word yoke. He says, take my yoke upon you. And when we think of a yoke, we think of these big oxen with these, you know, this, this wooden, you know, necklace thing around their neck. And they're out, you know, tilling up the land. It's dusty. It's hot. There's a farmer, you know, geeing and hawing and all that kind of stuff. And, but I don't think that's what Jesus was referring to in this passage. I don't think that's what, what he meant or what he was talking about. I think what he was talking about is what Paul referred to or what Paul was talking about in Galatians chapter 5. And if you would, flip over to Galatians chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 1. Paul says this. He says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free, and do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. See, Jesus came that we would be free from the law. The law of Moses pointed to one thing. We're sinners, and we need a Savior. But what the Pharisees were doing in Jesus' time is they were saying, no, 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 no. In order to be saved, you got to take on the law. you gotta, you got to take on this, this excess stuff. You've got to try to live out the law. And not only that, you know, there's the book of Moses and, or, and all the things that he said, but we're also going to heap on these other things. And we're going to heap this on and this on. If you read down in, in, in Galatians chapter 5, verse 4, he actually says, You have become estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by the law. Again, the book of Moses, the, the five books that he wrote, never was intended to save us. And actually, that verse says that it estranged the Jewish pe people from Christ. They were separated from him because they were trying to do it in their own works. They were trying to attain salvation in a way that it was never meant to be attained. This word justified that we see in Scripture is all it's talking about. It's a big word for salvation. And these Pharisees on the Jewish people were heaping on in order to be saved. you got to do this. You, you can't walk this distance on the Sabbath. You can't do this. You can't do that. You've got to do this. You've got to do things the specific way. A few weeks ago, I was at a funeral. A good friend of mine's dad passed away. And his brother-in-law was given the eulogy. And before, the, before the, the funeral, we were talking. And his brother-in-law was talking about how simple the gospel is. And I'm like, yes, it's simple. And he followed that up by saying, but we've complicated it. And he starts telling me of a story. A friend of his says that in order to be saved, you've got to be a member of their church. Well, my, my friend's brother-in-law is very analytical. And he starts asking questions like, well, how long, how long has your church been in existence? Right? If I have to be saved in order to be a member of your church, how long has it been around? And, he, you know, the guy answered, you know, 10, 20 years, whatever. And he goes, oh, okay. So for 6,000 years of human history, all those people died and went to hell because they weren't a member of your church that didn't even exist? It doesn't make logical sense. We have churches in our community in Jackson County that believe that in order to be saved, you must uh, be baptized. And if that's true, then the Bible, the story of Jesus when he was hanging on the cross is a lie. The Romans were expert at murdering. They knew how to murder people. They didn't care about the eternal salvation of somebody who was dying on the cross. When the thief on the cross looked at Jesus and said, Lord, remember me when you enter into your kingdom. And Jesus said back to him, today I tell you the truth, you'll be with me in paradise. 
Baptism is not a part of salvation. The Romans didn't say, oh no, let's stop. Let's stop the process. He can't die. We care about his eternal security. Let's get him down from there. Let's go baptize him. Well, then let's put him back up and let make sure that he dies for the crimes that he committed. It didn't happen. The Romans would not do that. And what we do when we add on these little things and is, is we become just like the Pharisees that, oh, well, you have to be baptized or be a part of a specific church, or you have to think a certain way, or, or you've got to take a vow of celibacy or a vow of silence, or you've got to speak in tongues. None of these things are scriptural. None of these things are salvation. Repent and believe is what the disciples preached. We cannot earn our salvation. And the more we try, it's this heavy weight that just keeps getting tackled onto us. And this burden becomes heavier because we're trying to do it ourselves. We're trying to do it in our own way. And that's not what Jesus intended. That's not the life of a Christian. We look back in, in Matthew chapter 11, verse 29. It says, take my yoke upon me and learn from me. See, when we are justified, when we're saved, when we come to Christ, we passed over from death into life. There's a responsibility that we have in that process. This idea that Jesus uses here of a, of a, of a yoke, it's a tool used in labor. There's a responsibility of the farmer and there's a responsibility of the animal, the oxen, to till that land up using that yoke. And the fact is, is when we accept Jesus, we take our, our yoke of self-sufficiency, self-reliance, we take our self-worth, we take everything about us and we take it off and we give it to Jesus and we put on his yoke. We put on his mission. We put on his will for our lives. This me mentality of our culture today tells us, no, 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 it's, it's my way. It's, I want it my way. I did it my way. It's, it's my life. It's now or never. I, I'm going to do with what I want to do. Tells us we should be living the American dream so that we can retire one day with gazillion dollars and sh sip champagne and, and eat caviar and not do anything. And that's not what the Bible teaches that the life of a Christian is supposed to be. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Luke says this. He says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And when, we, when he says deny ourselves, what he's referring to there is deny our desires, deny ourselves what we want, deny ourselves putting our needs first. We deny ourselves. But that verse also says take up our cross. And we talked about this in youth and students, the boys, a couple of weeks ago. What does it mean to take up your cross? See, back, back in the days that this was written, the Romans were in control, and every person who lived under Roman law knew exactly what that meant. Again, Romans were master murderers. They knew how to kill people. They knew how to inflict the most pain possible without killing somebody, and then ultimately take their life. When anybody back in the day of Jesus saw a cross, it meant one thing. Somebody's going to die on that. It meant death. It meant that when I get up every day, I die to Corey. Corey doesn't exist anymore. When I go to work, I'm, I'm doing what God wants me to do to the best of my ability for his glory. I don't do it for Corey's glory. I do it for God's. When I pay my taxes, it means that I'm honest because God wants me to be honest in paying my taxes. As God is honest, he's not a liar. And it means that when we see shine, signs at, at shopping centers that say, please return card, it means that we return our cards. <laughs> <laughs> We die to ourselves. It means we embrace the mission that God, God has for us. It means every day we read the, read the word of God. We pray. We tithe. We come to church. We share our faith. And we serve others. Back in 29, verse 29, he says, learn from me. Learn from me. It's an amazing phrase. Learn from me. See, back then, the disciples could learn straight from Jesus' mouth. They got to hear 
his words. They got to see the miracles. Today, we have just as good of a, a copy of that. It's the word of God. We want to learn from Jesus. We got to read. I don't want to embarrass anybody here. But it was, it's very common for Jewish people by the age of 12 to learn the first five books of the, of the Bible. The, the, the law of Moses. They had it memorized by the age of 12. It's very common 100 years ago that followers of Jesus would actually have the first four books of the New Testament memorized. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. I tried to memorize John one, one time, failed miserably, and swore I'd never try again. But how are you learning from Jesus? Mandalorian is out, right? The second season. Thank you, Abby. <laughs> how many of us have seen the entire season, but how many of us in that same amount of time has read one word of the, of the, the book of God? How many of us have opened this Bible to read what God has to say to us? When we accept Christ, it's not just about coming to church on Sunday. We can't live the life of Christ by coming to church on Sunday, going home, and continuing to live the way we want to live. We are to learn. And that's each one of our responsibilities if you call yourself a believer in Christ. But this yoke that Jesus is talking about, it has some cool, cool things about it. Maybe... Um, cool to me and hopefully you'll see how cool it is but see we have a responsibility just like that oxen we have a responsibility but Jesus also has a responsibility Jesus has a responsibility to us and this is another reason we need to read the word of God how do we know Jesus' promises if we don't know they exist if we don't read them for ourselves in Matthew chapter 11 back in verse 29 he says I am gentle and lowly in heart and you will find rest for your souls See, when we make that decision to follow Jesus, he is gentle with us. It says, I am gentle and lowly in heart. He knows what we're going through, and he lovingly guides us through it. And my visualization for this is, I don't know if you all in the era of COVID have eaten at a restaurant, but that moment when I put the hand, my, my hand on the small of my wife's back, and we're at a restaurant, and I guide her through the restaurant to where we're going to sit. She's not pulling me, and I'm not pushing her. It's a moment where she knows I'm connected to her. It's a moment that is gentle. It's a moment that's tender. And that's what Jesus does for us. When we're going through something crazy that doesn't make any sense, he's there with his hand guiding us through it. When we have a tragedy, he's there guiding us through it. And when we have the good things in our life, he's the one that gives it, and he's there. He's there with us. In order to take Jesus up on our promise, his promise, we need to be under the responsibility of his yoke. Far too often, far too often, we're sitting in the barn where the hooves propped up, drinking a grass smoothie, right? Watching the Colts play the, uh, the Broncos on TV, you know, just not doing what we have been called to do. We need to be willing to die to ourselves and get out there and start planting. And our, our field, our, our, our uh, uh, field that we're supposed to be plowing and planting seeds is, is Jackson County. And there's work that needs to be done. There are people dying every day apart from God, apart from Jesus. And we have a responsibility as a, ch as a church to, to do something about that. But what are we going to do? Are we going to let that keep going on and just try to stay in these four walls? The mission is for every person to get out there and share their faith. It's not the responsibility of just the staff and the elders or the leaders of this church. It is every person who calls themselves a follower of Christ is to get out there and share their faith. It's the only thing that's going to save a dying world. Jesus finishes this passage, this passage in Matthew chapter 11 with verse 30, and he says, For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. The only way we get to experience that, only way is if we get out of our own bubble. We stop focusing on ourselves. 
We focus on Jesus. We focus on his mission. We focus on his life that he has for us. We focus on doing the things that he's called us to do. We get tethered to Jesus instead of ourselves, instead of whatever is important to us at the time. Jesus should be more important to you than anything. And that's easy to say getting up here preaching on Sunday morning. It's hard to live. I know that myself. It's hard to live. There are days I go where I don't give God the due he deserves. And I would argue that's probably every day of my life. But I'm swinging at it. And that's what we got to do is swing at it. So here's the, the logical question after reading through Matthew the book, uh, uh, chapter 11, verses 28 through 30, the, co- the logical question we need to ask ourselves is how do we embrace this yoke? How do we get this easy yoke that has a light burden? Because we have a responsibility. How do we embrace it? Well, here are a few ways that we can embrace the yoke of Christ. First, we've got to come to Jesus. The yoke is for those who believe. We need to know Jesus in a real and personal, personal way. See, it isn't enough that we know that there was a man who lived 2,000 years ago, who his name was Jesus, that he came to earth and that he was born and, and he lived a perfect sinless life and um, he got crucified and he rose on the third day. That's great information to have, but that information won't save you. That information won't change your life unless you let it change your life, if you do something about it. See, when sin entered the world, it created this huge divide between God and us. And there's no amount of getting baptized. There's no amount of speaking in tongues. There's no amount of of, uh, joining a church. There's no amount of good works that is ever going to bridge that gap to get you back in a relationship with God. And that's why Jesus had to come. That's why Jesus had to be born the way he was born. He came. To give us the greatest gift that has ever been given. That gift is for anyone who accepts it. That gift is his shed blood on the cross. He died for our sins. The Bible calls that an atoning sacrifice. He is the atonement that we cannot do ourselves. We can't do anything to save ourselves. He had to come and he had to die. His blood pays for the sin. Of the world for those who accept it. All you got to do is accept it. Every person has to make a decision in their life. Do they follow God or do they keep going their own way and doing their own thing and doing what they want to do? In a little bit, I'm going to pray. And if you want to make that decision today, I encourage you to do that. And I'm going to help you through that process. The second way that we embrace the yoke of Jesus is we die to ourselves. Jesus makes it clear in Luke, we are to die to ourselves. If you are a follower of Jesus, we deny what we want and we seek what he wants. It's, it's, it's simple, but it's also very difficult. Paul had this down. The apostle Paul, he was so successful because every day he lived, he died to himself. He changed the world because he died to himself. He was in prison. He was persecuted. He ultimately died because of his faith. But he died to himself. He's a great example of what it looks like. And what does that mean for us today? It means that instead of focusing on what's in front of our face, what's what we want now, it means we start becoming eternal thinkers. We internal prospectors. We think about our neighbors who we love, who we want to see in heaven. It means that when we want to go to every concert in Atlanta and waste a bunch of time, we weigh out the consequences. Or if we want to go to every sporting event in Atlanta and sit there and watch the Falcons lose, that's okay too. But it means that we we think about what's important. And maybe we spend that time being part of a missional outreach in the church to try to get people to come to Christ. Matter of fact, we have a missional outreach coming up in the beginning of of January, January 4th through the 7th. We're calling it Pop-Up Church. And it's an idea to get out of these four walls and share our faith with people in the middle of them doing their daily lives. They're just living the way that they want to live. We're going to go behind B4 Brady's, their parking lot back there. We're going to set up a church. We're going to have people singing. We're going to have a tent set up where hopefully people will come. And ask questions about Jesus. And hopefully we get to share our faith. And hopefully we see life change. 
Because we're getting to a point where non-believers aren't coming to church. We've got to leave these four walls and we've got to get out there where non-believers are and show them that Jesus is the only way to be saved from a life separate, separated from your eternity. It's not about what's in front of your face. It's about the, long, the long-term goal. This is the first step in our church becoming more missional in this community to try to reach people for Christ. And if you're interested in that, you want to become a part of it, talk to me, talk to Pastor Rod, and we'll get you the information. It's only for a couple hours a night, one or two hours a night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. Come and be a part of it. But this is why Sunday morning church isn't enough anymore. It's not enough. The mission is too too valuable. It's too important to stay inside these walls and think that we're going to do the mission that God's called us to do while sitting in here. We die to ourselves. And lastly, the way we embrace the yoke of Jesus is to serve others. We serve others. This is a major responsibility for every follower of Jesus. The only way to get out of our bubble, only way I can get out of my bubble is to serve other people. The only way I can get my focus off of me and wanting what I want and want the paint that I want on the walls is to get out and start serving other people. Start showing people the love of Christ. We belong to each other. If you are a follower of Christ, you belong to me and I belong to you. Just like the heart and the brain, they belong to each other. Neither one is more important. They can't live without the other. The brain needs the heart to pump to keep it alive. And the heart needs the brain to keep telling it what to do so that it stays pumping. In the same way, the body of Christ works together. Not everybody's a Rod's Wimpke. Not everybody's a bow with the technological, technological whiz that he is on the, on the board. Not everybody's a David Hooper can sing. But every person who is in the body of Christ has a responsibility to the body of Christ. The body of Christ is missing hands. It's missing feet. Only way we get out of our own bubbles is to serve other people. We have our children's wing opening, hopefully next week. And we need volunteers. We need people that are willing to to take children and help them learn who Jesus is. We got a pre-K, K K through five, and a nursery. And this is the beautiful part about being a volunteer. It sounds like it's a lot of work, but it's really not. Because what you're doing is you're allowing a parent to clear their mind for an hour at a time. To come in and worship Jesus in a real way. And if that parent may not know who Jesus is, they have the opportunity, child-free, to hear in the gospel. To make a decision. We treat the, the, the children as, oh, it's beneath me. It's beneath me. Rod's been in there. Rod's been in the nursery. I don't know if he's changed diapers, but he's been in there. There's a responsibility bigger than the task at hand. And it's salvations. And every part is needed for that to happen. We die to ourselves. When we come to Jesus, we die to ourselves and we serve others. That's our responsibility as believers and followers of Christ. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, you are holy. Lord, you are righteous. Lord, you are King of kings and Lord of lords. Lord, we ask you to just be with us. Lord, pull on the hearts. Draw the hearts to you, Lord, that only you can do. Lord, we pray for life change today. Lord, we pray for salvations. With every head bowed and every head closed, if you may not know Jesus today. The gospel is so simple. Repent and believe. All you need to do is ask Jesus to be your forgiver and be your leader. The Bible says that if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's not about the prayer that you say. It's not about anything other than the condition of your heart. If you want to accept Christ today, if you want to follow him today, if you want to be under his yoke and not under your yoke, 
Just say something like this. Say something like this to Jesus. Jesus, Lord, I'm a sinner. Lord, I, I know that you are who you say you are, that your word is true. Jesus, I confess that, that I need you to save me and I can't save myself. Lord, be my forgiver. Forgive me of my sins and be my leader. If you prayed that prayer, share that with me. I'll be in the back of the room. And those of you here who call yourselves believers, I just want to encourage you to, to just think about who you are in Christ. Jesus, we love you. We give you glory. Lord, we're thankful to all, to all that you do for us. In your name we pray. Amen. And while David sings this song, I want to encourage you. This is a moment between you and God. Nobody else is here. If you accepted Christ or if you want to learn what your next step is, I'll be back at the table. For those of you who are believers in Christ, I want you to ponder that question I started with. Who are you tethered to? And is there enough evidence to say that you're tethered to Jesus? This is a moment between you and God. If you want to sing, sing. If you want to stand up, stand up. But worship Him and think about where you are in your walk. Thank you. Come out of sadness from wherever you've been. Come broken hearted, but rescue begin. Come find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. And earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. And earth has no sorrow that heaven can heal. So lay down your Oh
You guys can have a seat real quick. So thank you guys very much for coming uh, this Sunday, two days after uh, Christmas. So David talked about this morning about how you guys are still in the uh, Christmas spirit. On the other end of that, how many of you guys were like me and took down that Christmas tree at 7.35 Saturday morning? Anybody in here do that? Because uh, that was definitely us. So whenever you guys came in, you got this connection card. Uh, take that out real quick and look at that. Please fill out on the front part just however much you feel comfortable doing. Uh, just name, address, social security number, blood type, all that good stuff. Uh, we'll get back with you. But seriously, just whatever you guys feel comfortable doing. On the other side, though, is the important stuff. So on the top, it says, I decided to be a follower of Jesus today. That's literally the whole reason why we're here. So if that was you today, or even if it's not you yet, but you're thinking about it, put that on there. We want to guide you through that journey. We want to be there with you. And we want to love you through it because it's tough, you know, like you're not going to accept Jesus today and then have a perfect life tomorrow. I can promise you that you're not. I promise you that. So on the other part of that, uh, the pop-up church, if you're interested in that, if you're interested in anything that we're doing here at church, please mark those down. Um, we want to give you some information and, and get you a part of our family. So with that being said, I'm going to pray for the offering. It's going to be right outdoor, out the doors whenever we leave, and then we'll be dismissed. So. Lord, thank you so much just uh, for the, this church in general. You know, th Thank you for Corey and, and your word through him today. Thank you for the people that came today. I pray for those that are not here today that we, could, it, that we can bring you to them. Please just give us that strength and power. Whenever we give, Lord, I pray that, that we give with our hearts and uh, we give as much as we can. And I also pray that the church uses it wisely. So thank you for everything that you've given us to be able to do this. In your name we pray, amen. So you guys are good to go. You guys have a great weekend. Thank you guys for coming. Looking forward to seeing you next week. Hey, thanks for following online today. We're so glad that you watched the videos. In fact, we want to continue to see you do so. Would you do us a favor uh, if, these, if these videos are ministering to you and God's using them in your life, subscribe to our YouTube channel. That way you can stay current with the new videos being uh, put on our channel. And also uh, go the extra step and, and ring that bell or punch that bell right there below. And you can uh, be alerted when we get a new video online. Uh, and by all means, please, if you could take a second and fill out the online connect card as a way to come back to us with any feedback or a way God ministered to you, we'd love to get those back from you as well. Have a great week. God bless you. Let's follow Jesus.